So what do the following words or phrases have in common? Tiananmen Square, the Dalai Lama, communist gangsters, and Cheng Guanchong. Well, back in 2012, they were all block search terms on Weibo. Weibo's pretty much like Chinese Twitter. So if you'd search for the name Cheng Guanchong then, all you'd get back would be the message, according to relevant laws and policies, results are not displayed. Intriguing. The thing is, at the time, people in China were desperate to hear about this man Cheng Guanchong. When his name was blocked, Weibo users started referring to him in code. They called him CGC, C Guangxi, and so on. And as every new code word was censored, another would spring up in its place. Eventually, at least 14 search terms associated with him were blocked. So who was this guy? Allegedly the most dangerous man in China. And why couldn't people talk about him? Well, Cheng Guancheng is a lawyer. He's a self-taught lawyer. He's a champion of disability rights, and he's a long-standing opponent of China's notorious one-child policy. And he's blind. But you know who explains this better than me? The man who'll be voicing his story in English. The actor, Christian Bale. I was sitting in a caravan in Nanjing, in China. I read an article about Guangcheng, and it literally made me want to vomit. Hearing about this man who should have been celebrated, who'd done nothing but good for disabled people, for farmers, for women. Just a, an absolutely altruistic man who um, lived in an incredibly uh, brave manner. Him and his family were being abused. They were kept inside of their house under house arrest. They were being abused physically. And just, I, I couldn't help but imagine the pain that that family was going through and these hideous men who were enforcing that upon them. And I just felt sick to my stomach. You're listening to In Their Own Words, a podcast series from Amnesty International that aims to get under the skin of iconic human rights activists and hear about their experiences firsthand. In each episode, we'll hear the personal story of an extraordinary human rights activist in their own words. Today, we hear from Cheng Guancheng. Some of Guancheng's experiences are pretty harrowing, so be warned, there are some unsettling descriptions in this episode. When I was about five or six, I was on a train coming back from a visit to my grandmother's house. My mother and I were sitting opposite a woman who was carrying a bucket of peanut oil. The conductor came by and he took the bucket from the woman who became very upset. I asked my mother, will he give it back to her? My mother said, why would he give back something he's already taken? I asked, but how? Can he just take her things as he pleases? She said, he took the peanut oil for the state. What will he do with it? Will he sell it? Will he give the woman the money after he sells it? My mother stopped answering my questions. I remember that woman crying and crying in front of all the passengers. This memory is very vivid in my mind. It was the first time I thought about the issue of social justice. My name is Cheng Guangcheng. I'm from Shandong province, China. I lived in a small village of less than 500 people called Dongxigu on the banks of a small river. The river flows through our village from the west, winding southwards, looping around our village. When I was growing up, the environment was quite beautiful and pristine and the people's minds were not yet polluted either. I have four older brothers, no sisters. We lived together with my mother most of the time. My father was often away working in another town. My mother had to work on the production team, earning points to help us earn a living. So my mother was out in the fields all day, and we would spend most of the time out in nature, exploring the area around our village and learning from the environment. 
All of the adults had to work in the production team from morning until night, so as soon as it was light, there would only be children left. I was less than six months old when I came down with a very high fever. My mother didn't have the two UN necessary to take me to the hospital to see a doctor, so my fever lingered untreated. She was required to work constantly for the production team, so she didn't have the time to care for me. That's how I lost my sight. My brothers were extremely important to me in understanding nature and the outside world. Because I'd lost my sight, they would often take me out to the forest or out to the fields and show me what was there. They'd bring me leaves from the trees or from plants and put them in my hands. I could clearly feel the shape of a leaf, its every line, those little patterns on its edges and the direction and angle of every vein on the leaf. I could even tell different plants apart from their smell or the taste of their leaves. All of this gave me a deeper understanding and appreciation of nature. After I'd learned about the different kinds of leaves, I'd want to know more. I'd ask my brothers, well, how does a leaf grow on a branch? And they would bring me a leaf on a branch and I'd feel that. From there, I'd want to know, how does this smaller branch attach to the tree? And they'd bring me an even larger branch. And eventually, I wanted to know what a whole tree was like. I could tell how the trunk of a tree met the ground, but I didn't know what it was like higher up. So my brothers had the idea to tie a rope around my waist and hoist me up a tree. Only then was I able to really understand what a tree was like. After I was able to understand plants and trees, my brothers would help me to learn about animals and insects. They would catch a grasshopper or a cicada and let me feel its shape, its head, its body, its wings, its legs. Slowly, I built up a clear understanding of the natural world. At one point, when I was very small, I wanted to know what a big ox looked like. So my brother took me out to the shepherd and his herd, grabbed an ox by the horns, and pulled its head down so I was able to feel its head, its horns, its ears, its neck. I said, but I can't feel the whole ox. So my brother lifted me up so I could stroke and feel its entire shape. Its tail was swishing back and forth and hitting my face. That's a very vivid memory for me. From when I was very young, my father, when he had the time, would tell me traditional Chinese stories, myths, legends, ghost stories, histories. After a few years, he told me all the stories he knew. So he would read to me. He read all sorts of things, novels from different dynasties. They'd immediately take me out of the world around me and back through thousands of years of history. There were stories of kings and emperors. I didn't understand what all these things were. So I'd ask, is the king the same as an emperor? Is an emperor the same thing as Chairman Mao? My father would simplify things for me. Yes, they're basically the same thing. But then I would have other questions. Eventually my father would get tired of my endless questions. There were also the stories of people's lives stories from all the different eras of how people became heroes, how they became cabinet ministers, how they became enlightened rulers. Those tales made me think a lot. I started to gain an understanding of how people in different circumstances reacted to the challenges they faced. I think this kind of an education was more profound than the formal education I would have received in school memorizing dry textbooks. For thousands of years in China, blind and disabled people have had to fend for themselves in society without government support. For blind people who have some independence of movement, 
maybe 40% of the blind population in rural areas. One option is to find a teacher who will train them in storytelling or fortune telling. They become wandering storytellers who earn a meager living traveling from village to village telling stories or reading fortunes. The rest of the blind population were totally dependent on their families. When a blind storyteller arrived in a village, he would rely on the villagers to offer him a place to stay, while other neighbors would band together to bring him something to eat. The decent, kind-hearted Chinese people would usually help the disabled the best they could. Blind people in China had no access to education at all. It wasn't until the 1980s that some schools for the blind gradually appeared. But as these opportunities emerged, people in villages became less willing to help out the blind storytellers who passed through. In part, as a response to the civil rights movement in the West, more and more schools for the blind were built. This was the start of education for the blind. But the vast majority could only study things like acupuncture and Chinese medicine. And there was a very limited possibility of employment for a blind person. I wasn't able to go to school until I was 18, when I enrolled in first grade at the Linyi School for the Blind in Linyi City. Later on, I was able to study at Nanjing University of Traditional Chinese Medicine. When I was studying acupuncture and massage, I was required to massage officials who had injured themselves through playing mahjong for too long. I didn't think I could do that job for my entire life. I felt that what the country needed was very different from that kind of work. There's a Chinese expression, a mediocre doctor will cure an illness, a good doctor will cure a person, and a great doctor will cure a nation. I felt what China needed was to cure its problem of social injustice. In the early 1990s, the law on the protection of persons with disabilities was introduced in China, which was supposed to protect disabled people from paying state taxes. Despite this, local officials continued to demand that the disabled pay tax. If they refused to, as was their right, officials had a number of ways to enforce their demands. They would send thugs over to rough up the family, to steal their possessions, their food, anything they could take to sell, even their livestock, saying that it was to offset the tax that they owed, but it was just theft. Around that time, a lot of disabled and poor people from my area started to seek me out to get advice on how to resolve the injustices they were facing. It was just a natural progression for me to become involved in this kind of work. In China, the law is merely a tool used by the Communist Party to control the population. They will happily enforce any laws that benefit them and ignore any that do not. If somebody came to me to seek advice about an issue of injustice, it was usually because they didn't have the money to pay a lawyer, or that a registered lawyer wouldn't take the case because it was too sensitive. As I worked on various individual cases, I had the idea of launching a class action case. I worked with another lawyer on behalf of a group of disabled people who were being forced to pay illegal taxes that they couldn't afford. I ensured some Chinese journalists were present to report on the trial. That case took a lot of twists and turns, but the disabled people represented in the lawsuit got the illegally collected taxes back. The authorities were quite annoyed and quite angry. They didn't have the backing from higher up to really persecute me in a violent way back then, but they desperately didn't want the outside world to know what was going on. For many years in China, family planning 
the one-child policy, as it's been known, has been enforced through violence. In 2005, in Ligny, officials started to worry that there were too many births. The area was exceeding its allowed quotas. So they started a particularly violent campaign to enforce the one-child policy in my area. They started sending groups of thugs out to towns and villages. They would find pregnant women and bring them into the so-called family planning centers where they would be forced to have abortions or sterilizations. If a pregnant woman escaped or they couldn't find her, they would arrest her family who would be beaten or tortured. She would then have no choice but to come out of hiding to have a forced abortion or sterilization. The result of these measures was that many people were beaten. Some were even beaten to death at the hands of the authorities. Some people committed suicide due to the extreme pressure they were under. If they found a pregnant woman, they would take her to the family planning center and regardless of the age of the fetus, they would abort it. If it was early on in the pregnancy, they would induce labor for the abortion. If it was slightly later on, they would insert a needle through the woman's navel into the head of the fetus to poison it. Sometimes a fetus would be to term. So they would also induce labor and the child might be crying and completely healthy but the doctor would wring the neck of the child or drown it in a bucket. I helped these women to seek justice and we launched an investigation into the practice. As we investigated, we found that in just six months, 130,000 people were subject to forced abortions and forced sterilizations including men. Some 600,000 people were detained, beaten, tortured for being related to someone who had overbirthed or simply being in the same village as someone who had overbirthed. If somebody wanted to go to the police to report what was happening, the police ignored them. If they went to the courts or the prosecutor's offices, nothing would happen. We tried to contact the media about the campaign, but we were told that anything that related to the family planning policy was banned from being reported. Everybody was too afraid to report on the situation. The authorities started following us and tried to prevent us from continuing our investigation. On the 1st of August, 2005, the authorities placed me under house arrest. We were surrounded by guards. They were in the whole of the village. They set up cell phone jammers, so I wasn't able to communicate with the outside world, and no one was able to visit us either. That lasted for seven months. Eventually, I was sent to jail. I refused to give in to their demands and insisted that they abide by the law. I didn't give in to them, so they used other prisoners to control me, to beat me and threaten me in other ways. One time, they beat me so viciously that for at least two months, I couldn't stand up. I had to kind of hunch over. I had a lot of wounds all over my body. When the scabs fell off, I kept them in a small plastic bag, hoping that I could later use them as evidence of what had happened to me. From the moment I got to prison, I never stopped trying to speak out and demand that the authorities follow the law. I lodged about 2,000 different requests, 
that they look into my case, that they investigate how I was treated. I started wearing my uniform inside out. A lot of the inmates thought I'd made a mistake, that I didn't know it was inside out. But I said, no, I'm doing this on purpose. It's all of you who are wearing it the wrong way around. When a warden pointed out that my uniform was inside out, I said, I'm wearing it the right way. The inside of the uniform is meant to face the criminal. My uniform is facing out because you are the real criminal. I served out my four-year sentence to the day, and when I was released, I was escorted back home by party officials. The authorities had stationed something like a hundred guards in my village. From then on, we were completely surrounded by guards at all times. After that, I was kept under harsh, illegal detention at home. All the phone lines were disconnected and they set up mobile phone signal jamming equipment around the house. They installed surveillance cameras and floodlights. Our house was now higher security than the prison had been. The Communist Party is just that evil. They're terrified that the crimes that they commit will be exposed. So in the process of trying to control me and my family, they spent some 70 or 80 billion UN Not long after I'd been put back under house arrest, I heard somebody from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs on the radio claiming that I was free. I knew that people had been trying to come to the village to visit us, but had been forcefully turned away. So we recorded a short video message that we managed to smuggle out, alerting people to the reality of our situation. Once word got to the authorities about the video we had made, we were brutally beaten in retaliation. On the 18th of February, 2011, the party sent 70 or 80 thugs in plain clothes to our yard and they began beating us mercilessly. They beat my wife, Wei Jing, with a club. The bone above her eye was fractured, swollen and black for a long time. They pushed her to the ground and threw a quilt over her body. Six or seven thugs stood on the edges of the quilt while they beat her brutally, kicking her all over. They grabbed my shirt collar from behind and they pulled it so tight, I couldn't breathe. They held my hands behind my back very tightly and someone stuck a very dirty rag into my mouth. They tortured us like this for five or six hours. As this went on, they searched our property using metal detectors looking for the video camera or cell phones or anything that they thought we could use to get information out. Eventually they left us lying there on the ground. We were so badly beaten we could barely move. Among the many things they confiscated from us was a big bag of letters, about a thousand that our friends from Amnesty International had sent to me. I had read every single letter and found them extremely moving, especially the cards from children I'd received from all over the world. By that time, I was in very ill health. I was very weak. And I knew that my only chance, my only hope, really, was to try to escape. Even though I knew there was a 90% chance that I would be caught and that they would probably beat me to death. But I knew that I couldn't continue living like this. Without medical treatment, i would probably die anyway. So I was always thinking of how I could escape. I tried many times, but when I was just about to make my move, the guards would spot me. So I would quickly pretend to be smelling the flowers, touching them, to see how much they'd grown, tricking the guards into thinking that I was just out having a look at the flowers. We also tried digging a tunnel at one point, but they found it.
on the 20th of April 2012, after countless failed attempts, a guard suddenly got up to fetch some hot water, blocking the other guard's view. Seizing the moment, I was able to flee. Reaching the wall of our yard, I slowly climbed over into our neighbor's yard. When I was scaling the far wall of my neighbor's yard, she suddenly returned home, so I had to climb up onto her roof and hid there to avoid her seeing me. Wei Jing had gone up onto our roof. She called out that I would have to make a move very quickly, otherwise they would see me. I knew there was a tree on the other side of the roof where I was, but I couldn't find it. I thought I was going to have to climb down bit by bit. The wall was maybe about 12 feet high. I was about halfway down the wall when I lost my grip and fell, which made the dog in this second neighbor's yard start barking wildly. I scurried over to a little animal pen and hid in there. I could hear the voices of lots of nearby guards very clearly. I made my way through two adjacent animal pens and into a third where I waited for some time. I knew if I went over the wall of the animal pen into the following yard, a guard would see me immediately. I remembered that a tractor had passed by in the morning and would probably be coming back in the evening the same way. The guard would have to make way for the tractor, which would block his line of sight for a moment. This would be my chance to get over the wall. So when the tractor came back in the afternoon, I was ready. When the guard moved his chair, I started to climb over. I sat on the top of the wall, got my body across, and then jumped right down. I landed on a pile of rocks and immediately felt an intense pain in my foot. My foot swelled up very quickly. My shoes started to split. It was extremely painful. I was thinking, I'm blind, still have to pass by so many more guards, get over so many walls, how can I do that now? How can I get out on one foot? But I knew there was no way back now, only one direction, forward. I could only crawl from that moment on. So I crawled to the house of some friends to ask for help. I tried for a long time to get their attention, but no one heard me. There was nothing I could do. It was 9 p.m. by this point. Eventually, I continued on to what would be the seventh wall in my path. It was very high and actually very loose, so I knew there was no way I could climb over it. After thinking about it for a long time, I decided that the only thing to do was to take the wall down brick by brick. I could hear a rooster crowing, so it must have been around two in the morning. I knew that if I didn't make a move, once it got light, I would be trapped. But if I got past the wall, there would be a guard stationed on the other side, watching over a road that I would have to cross. What should I do? Luckily, it started to drizzle, and the guard moved his chair slightly. When I got through the wall, I lay prone on the ground, listening to the movements around me, figuring out where the guard was. The sound of the rain on the ground was telling me what was in front of me and where the road was. Slowly, cautiously, I crawled across the road on my hands and knees. I made it to some gardens. The ground was very muddy. I could no longer walk upright. I'd crawl a bit and stand up but walking for even a few steps was very painful. I climbed over another wall and down into a wooded area through a gully. By this time, I was really on my hands and knees most of the time. I couldn't stand up and walk. I crawled along the side of a very steep and rocky riverbank. I was covered in mud and it was raining. I had wounds all over my body. My knees and arms were scraped and bloodied, my clothes torn the cloth stuck to the wounds on my body. Even my face was probably covered in blood and I'm sure I looked unrecognizable. 
Eventually, I got to a neighbouring village and managed to find a friend who I had helped previously. He was astonished to see me. He said, how did you escape from so many people? They have so many guards, not just in your village, but here too. There are lots of patrols. They have thugs all over the bus station, so there's no way you can leave. Later on, we got in touch with some friends for help, and they drove me to Beijing, where we decided to contact the American Embassy. Eventually, with the help of many supporters, I came to the US, where I live now, a truly free life. I want to express my deep thanks to the US government and the American Embassy for allowing me to seek refuge. I want to express my deep thanks to every one of those people, everyone who's helped me along the way. I will never forget what you have done for me. I also want to thank Amnesty supporters and members. I want you to know that what you do is not in vain. We do feel your support. I felt it when I was in China, and it is extremely important. So there you have it, the amazing story of an incredible man. If you'd like to know more about Guan Chung and his work, his memoir, The Barefoot Lawyer, is out now, published by Macmillan. We'd like to thank Guan Chung, his wife, Wei Jing, and interpreter, Danica Mills. We'd also like to thank Christian Bale for voicing this episode. Remember when Guan Chung spoke about people trying to visit him under house arrest? Well, Christian was one of those people we asked him to tell us what happened when he tried to visit Guan Chung. I had no idea how to get to Guan Chung's house slash prison. But I contacted some journalists who had tried to visit Guan Chung and his family before. And I contacted them and I said, I want to do this. Would you guys like to take me there? Come along. You can document it. You know, the whole point was to get his story out there. I was told that, you know, my cell phone would be being listened to and... Um, sorts of silliness like that and so you know we, we met up very early in the morning and headed off we arrived just outside of Dongshugu and they said right we've got to get out of the car because it's got Beijing plates if they see Beijing plates they'll know we're outsiders and know we're up to something and if they see us going towards Guangchang's place no that will never make it there that'll be it we'll be uh, pulled aside and we'll never get there so we got in a taxi and then when the guy driving found out where we were going, he slammed on the brakes, he said, get out. So we all got dumped out. We thought, ah, oh, damn, no one's going to take us. And then um, we met a man who had a van, and he said, absolutely. He, he wanted to take us, that he was disgusted with um, the treatment of Guangchang. So he took us, and uh, we, 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 were, we were getting closer and closer, and we were thinking, oh, are we going to be stopped any second? And amazingly, we were going down these little tiny lanes and we were getting right close to Guangchang's place. And then we got as far as we could in the van. And then we got out and there was a whole lot of men who started walking towards us in all these uh, big, thick coats. The journalists I'd gone with, they said to me, look, Christian, you're in China. Do not, no matter how much you might get hit, punched, do not hit back because we just might not ever see you again. So, all right, I took that on board. We got out. I saw straight away these guys set on the cameraman, trying to pull the camera from him. And within seconds, he was on the floor. They were kicking him. They were trying to pull this camera off of him, punching him. Some of them were throwing rocks. I pulled out this little camera that I had when I saw that he wasn't getting any footage. I started to try to film myself. You know, my ultimate goal was I really wanted to be able to actually meet Guan Chung. I wanted to shake his hand and just tell him what an inspiration he was. And I realized, right, that's not going to happen at all. So this was going on. I was kind of, you know, standing but curled in a ball trying to stop them from grabbing the camera. They're all pulling at my arms and punching and the cameraman's on the floor and he's getting kicked. And then um, the other journalists are getting pushed around and shoved. And then I hear one of them shout, Christian, get in the car now. And I could hear, you know, the seriousness in their voice. And there were more, more men arriving, more. They were thugs. They had a ridiculous amount who, who surrounded Guang Chung's and his family's house. And the driver of that van was extraordinary. He had managed to reverse, spin it around, 
he had the the engine revving he had the door open and we all had to run and we literally dived in the side of this van slammed the door and the guy took off we were going through ditches we ended up going through fields he'd covered up his plates in the hope that they wouldn't know who he was and you know, real bravery that this man was showing eventually it was about 45 minutes we you know realized okay and no one's following us anymore because they were they were right up behind us for, for ages chasing us we gave whatever money we had in our pockets um to the to the wonderful gentleman who had driven us there to help to repair his car and amazingly he turned to us and he said you want to do this again i'm your man i'll do it straight away wonderful to see that in, in the midst of all of that oppression and the threat of violence that there was somebody who um without any planning without any notice was willing to take an enormous risk in helping us. So we hadn't gotten to see Guangchang, and obviously that was very disappointing, and we started on our way back to Beijing. He got a little bit of attention, put his name out there a little bit. But then um, this amazing man, Guangchang, blind, managed to escape. And, um, and then we all read about him in uh, 2012, uh, when he got to the US Embassy in Beijing, went through these very trying negotiations, but eventually ended up in the US. And um, that was when I finally got to, uh, to meet Guangchang and meet his wonderful family and uh, hug him and talk and have him come around my house. And, um, and it's such an honor to be able to call him a friend and um, to see his family free and in the States but the terrible tragedy is that he should never have had to come here in the first place. He's um, the best of what human beings aspire to be. He should be celebrated. He should be a national hero within China, but instead he's been, he's been chased from his country. But that's a real tragedy. The truly happy ending would be that Guangchang and his family were able to live free and happy within China. And hopefully one day that can happen. I'm Anna Beccarelli. Thanks for listening to Amnesty's In Their Own Words, and please remember to subscribe. 